Hare Krishna. So today we have our uh, session number 26 already. And today we have chapter 316 that uh, is Jain Vijaya are cursed by the Kumaras. But also, apart from that, we will discuss another interesting topic today, is that how is that that the soul comes to the material world, right? Why we are there? Why we are here? No one falls from Vaikuntha, so why we are here in the material world? So that's another point that we will discuss today. So, okay, so starting. Uh, at the end of chapter 15, right, in the last session, uh, we saw that the four Kumaras, they offered uh, prayers to the Lord uh, when he appeared at the gate, right? So now in chapter 16, the Lord answers to these prayers and he offers a solution for the situation, like right, for this conflict between Jaya and Vijaya and the Kumaras. So the point is that Jaya and Vijaya, they are eternal servitors of the Lord. But at the same time, they committed a mistake in stopping the sages, right? They were not supposed to do that. So the Lord understood that the essence of the problem was that the Kumaras, they were anxious to see him, right? That's why they became angered. They became angered because they wanted so much to see the Lord. And Jaya and Vijaya, they were stopping them. So therefore, the Lord went personally there, accompanied by Lakshmi Devi to give audience to the Kumaras, right? And in his purport, Prabhupada mentions uh, the case of Haridas Thakura, right? And uh, he was also not allowed to enter the temple to see Lord Jagannath in Puri, right? So many pure devotees, they were not allowed to enter in the temple and are not allowed to enter in the temple. Uh, so just like the Lord came to see the, the Kumaras, he was also coming to see, he was coming like personally to see Haridas Thakura as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Like, so when the pure devotees, they are not allowed to enter the temple to see the Lord, then the Lord comes out, comes outside to, to meet the devotees, right? And that's what happened here. The Lord came outside to meet the, Kumar, the Kumaras. So uh, Prabhupada says that, Quote, the Lord is so merciful that even if there is some impediment for the devotee, he himself ma manages the matter in such a way that the devotee is not bereft of having audience at his lotus feet. Right? Haribo. So, okay. So, however, there was still the question of the, of the offense committed by Jai and Vijay. Right? So, that's another, that was another issue. So, the Lord said, Quote, uh, these attendants of mine, Jaya and Vijaya, uh, by name, have committed a great offense against you because of ignoring me. O oh, great sages, I approve the, of the punishment that you who are devoted to me have meted out to them. To me, the Brahmana is the highest and most beloved personality. The disrespect shown by my attendants was actually... Uh, has actually been displayed by me because the doormen are my servitors. I take this to be an offense by myself. Therefore, I seek your forgiveness for the incident that has arisen. Right? That these are verses two to four. So, how can we understand that? <laughs> so, uh, in his purport, Srila Prabhupada makes the point that an offense to, uh, to a devotee of the Lord is always wrong, right? Even if you, and even if one is promoted to Vaikuntha, there is still the, sh the chance that one may commit offenses. The difference, however, is that even if such you know, advanced devotees accidentally commit some offense, they are protected by the Lord, right? Different, and this is different from conditioned souls who are averse to the Lord and have to face the results of their activities by themselves, right? So even if a, uh, uh, an associate of the Lord commits some offense, he's protected from the result of this offense by the Lord, right? So the Lord very politely, he accepted the offense of Jaya and Vijaya, like an offense committed by himself. He took responsibility, uh, saying that a wrong act 
committed by a servant leads people in general to blame his master. Just as a spot of white leprosy on any part of the body pollutes all of the skin. Uh, he then accepted the, the, the curse uttered by the Kumaras, right? He said, quote, These servants of mine have transgressed against you, not knowing the mind of their master. I shall therefore then eat a favor done to me. If you order that, although reaping the fruit of their transgression, they may return to my presence soon, and, and the time of their exile from my abode might expire before long. Right, so from verses uh, 6 to 12, the Lord, he reassures the Kumara of their of his appreciation for their devotional service and also of his divine protection to all his devotees. And as Prabhupada explains in his purport, this doesn't just apply to pure devotees like the Kumaras, right? Of course, it applies to pure devotees, but not only. Uh, it applies, in fact, to any person who is seriously practicing Krishna consciousness. Why? Because even if one is not a pure devotee now, the fact that he is practicing means that it's just a matter of time because before he becomes purified. And as a result, he is immediately accepted by the Lord. And the Lord becomes ready to give him our protection. Right? Interesting. Because the Lord can see the future. So if one is going to become a pure devotee of the Lord, the Lord doesn't see this difference, this gap in time. He already sees him as a pure devotee. Right? Interesting. And then there is a quote for that, about that. So, quote, The conclusion is that if one takes to Krishna consciousness with all seriousness, he is to be understood as always purified, as Krishna is ready to give him protection by all means. The Lord assures Herein that he is ready to give protection to his devotee, even if there is need to cut part of his own body. Right? Very interesting, right? And now we come to the next point. Ah, sorry, that, that was the first point here, Jain Vijaya cursed by the Kumaras. I forgot to change the slide. <laughs> and now uh, we already are going to the uh, second point, that Lord Vishnu protects his associates. So, uh, one of the meanings of this chapter is exactly that the Lord is so eager to protect his devotees that he is ready to even cut his own arm if, so, if somehow it becomes hostile to his devotees, right? So, so what you say about punishing others, right? If, if the Lord is ready to cut his own arm, right? If the arm somehow offends his devotees, so what to say about others. So a devotee can thus be confident in his practice of devotional service and understand that although material reverses they can be present, his ultimate success is assured, right? So this is very clear stated in this uh, chapter. That's one of the main points here, actually. Uh, uh, when we read, when we study these chapters, we, we focus a lot in the fall of Jaya and Vijaya, but actually the main topic here is the protection of the Kumaras. So this chapter, he makes this point that Krishna loves his devotees so much that even if the, his servants in Vaikuntha, they get in the way, they obstruct the devotee in some way, they are punished. <laughs> what to say about anyone else, right? So uh, no one can prevent a devotee from achieving perfection, from reaching the Lord. Right? No one can do it apart from the devotee himself. Only the devotee himself can prevent himself to of achieving the Lord. Right? Apart from the devotee, no one else has this power. Uh, so, on the other hand, uh, the Lord also glorifies the attitude of Jaya and Vijaya, who, although being cursed, right, by the Brahmanas, they didn't think of retaliating, right? And on this point, the Lord said, there is a quote here, that's verse 11. So, quote, on the other hand, they captivate my heart, who are gladdened in heart, and who, their lotus faces enlightened by nectarian smiles, respect the brahmanas, even though the brahmanas utter harsh words. They look upon the brahmanas as my own self, and pacify them by praising them, in loving words, even as a son would appease an angry father, or as I am pacifying you. Right, so the Lord glorifies the 
uh, Jain Vijaya also. So, Prabhupada explains that uh, the whole situation in more detail in his purport to verse 12. So, Prabhupada says here, <clears throat> I'm going to read, this quote is a little long. Yeah. So, Prabhupada says that, Quote, from this statement, we can understand how anxious the Lord is to get his servitor back into Vaikuntha. Therefore, this incident proves that those who have once uttered, no, uh, who have once entered a Vaikuntha planet can never fall down. The case of Jaya and Vijaya is not a fall down. It is just an accident. The Lord is always anxious to get such devotees back to the Vaikuntha planets as soon as possible. It is to be assumed that there was that there is no possibility of a misunderstanding between the Lord and the devotees. But when there are discrepancies or disruptions between one devotee and another, one has to suffer the consequences, although that suffering is temporary. The Lord is so kind to his devotees that he took all the responsibility for the doorman's, doorman's offense and requested the sages to give them facilities to return to Vaikuntha as soon as, pro as possible. So you see, this, this shows the protection of the Lord to, his, to all his devotees, right? To both the Kumaras and also to Jai and Vijay. So the Kumaras, they could understand that although the Lord was speaking as if he was wrong, right? He was taking the blame upon himself. Uh, he was actually speaking in such a humble way just to show them his uh, favor. And the words of the Lord sounded very mysterious to them because although the Lord is the supreme controller, right, of everything and the cause of all causes are uh, worshipable by all demigods, uh, he values uh, so much Brahminical culture that he shows example himself by worshiping Brahmanas like the four Kumaras and so on. Like right? so, this is all due to his causeless mercy to 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 everyone, right? And uh, they they the the Kumaras they elaborate on these points on their prayers that they offer to the Lord a little later in the chapter. So they say, quote, O Lord, you are the protector of the highest of the twice born. If you do not protect them by offering worship and mild words, then certainly the auspicious path of worship will be rejected by people in general who act on the strength and authority of your Lordship. Dear Lord, you never want the auspicious path to be destroyed. You are the reservoir of all goodness, just to benefit people in general. You destroy the, the evil element by your mighty potency. You are the proprietor of the three, the three creations and the maintainer of the entire universe. Therefore, your potency is not reduced by your submissive behavior. Raid, uh, rather, by submission, you exhibit your transcendental pastimes, right? So the position of the Lord, the transcendental position of the Lord as a supreme controller is not diminished uh, because, you know, he acts so humbly right in front of the Kumaras. So uh, one point interesting here in this passage and in also other passages is that when the word Brahmanas is mentioned, it should be understood that it refers to both, both Brahmanas and uh, Vaishnavas. Because Vaishnavas, they are automatically Brahmanas because they practice the essence of Brahminical culture, which is devotional service to the Lord. Right? So even if a Vaishnava, he doesn't follow all the rules and regulations of Brahminical life, he still is considered a Brahmana because he's doing the essence of Brahminical life that is worshipped to the Lord. So this is an interesting point. So in his purports, uh, Prabhupada elaborates on, on the crucial importance of Brahmanas and Vaishnavas to human society. And then he concludes that, quote, if the authorities of the leaders of society do not give respect to the Brahmanas and Vaishnavas and do not offer them not only sweet words, but all facilities, then the path of progress will be lost to human civilization. The Lord personally wanted to teach this, and therefore he offered so much praise to the Kumaras, right? Haribo. So after being praised by the Lord in like in such a nice way, 
uh, the hearts of the Kumaras were softened and they started uh, regret having cursed Jaya and Vijaya, like understanding now that they are eternal servitors of the Lord and they have all good qualities. And their mistake in stopping them uh, can thus be considered a fault, just but just an accident, right? And, 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 and should have not been taken seriously. So thinking like this, the Kumaras said that, O oh Lord, whatever punishment you wish to award to these two innocent persons, or also to us, we shall accept without duplicity. We understand that we have cursed two faultless uh, persons, right? That's verse 25. So, the, so the, this whole incident is very nice because it's a, a great example of Vaishnava etiquette. That's another meaning here. It's because Jaya and Vijaya, they committed a mistake by not allowing the Kumaras to see the Lord, right? And as a result, the sages, they become angry and cursed them, right? But the gatekeepers, uh, they didn't retaliate, right? They assumed a humble, a humble position. And the Lord then appeared in the scene, the scene they appeared there. He pacified the Kumaras with soft words. He take the blame for the actions of, the, of his servitors, right? And as a result, the Kumara also became humble. And they regretted having cursed Jaya and Vijaya, right? Understanding that they are faultless servants of the Lord. So you see that the behavior of everyone here is exemplar, right? That the, the, the example, the behavior of Jaya and Vijaya, the behavior of the Lord, and then also the later uh, behavior of the Kumaras, right? Regretting uh, that they had offended, uh, that they had cursed the Kumaras. So, so great example, right? Of how to solve like conflicts between the voters. Even if some conf conflict appears, if everyone is humble and you know tolerant and so on, these conflicts, they can be solved uh, very easily, right? Uh, so the Lord then, he revealed to them his divine plan behind the whole situation. So he said, quote, O Brahmanas, know that the punishment you inflicted on them was originally ordained by me, and therefore they will fall in, in, uh, to a birth in a demoniac family, but they will be firmly united with me in doubt through mental concentration, intensified by anger, and they will return to my presence shortly. And in this poor part, uh, Prabhupada explains this point, right? That's quite interesting. So Prabhupada says, quote, The Lord stated that the punishment inflicted by the sages upon the doorkeepers, Jaya and Vijaya, was conceived by the Lord himself, because without the Lord's sanction, nothing can happen. And it is to be understood that there was a plan in the cursing of the Lord's devotees in Vaikuntha, and his plan is explained by many Star Wars activities. The Lord sometimes desires to fight. The fighting spirit also exists in the Supreme Lord. Otherwise, how could fighting be manifested at all? Uh, because the Lord is a source of everything, anger and fighting are also in inherent in his personality. When he desires to fight with someone, he has to find an enemy. But in the Vaikuntha words, there is no enemy because everyone is engaged fully in his service. Therefore, he sometimes comes to the material world as an incarnation in order to manifest his fighting spirit. So after receiving the darshan of the Lord, right, the Kumaras, they felt fully satisfied and returned uh, to their duties in the material world, right? So the Kumaras from the door, they returned uh, back uh, to the material world. And now we come to the interesting part. Jaya and Vijaya come to the material world, like Haribo. <laughs> so, uh, so, the, uh, so after the, Kumara, the Kumaras left, the Lord then addressed Jaya and Vijaya, revealing that although he could nullify the course of the, the, uh, the, the curse of the sages, he chose to not do so. And instead he gave his approval to it fixing a term of, term of three lives in which Jaya and Vijaya, they would come to the material world as demons and then after that return to their positions in the uh, spiritual world. So with this, the, the scene, like for many of the pastimes, 
narrated in the Srimad Bhagavatam was set. Because Jain Vijaya, they would appear as Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha, and they set the stage for the appearance of the Lord as Varahadeva and Rishinhadeva, also the appearance of Pralada Maharaja and others, and then also the Lord later would appear as Ravan and Kubakarna, leading to the appearance of Lord Rama, and many other wonderful pastimes, right? And then, in their last lives, they would come as Sisupala and Dantavakra, participating in the Lord's pastimes out of Vrindavan, right? Haribo. Uh, interesting that if you read Srimad Bhagavatam, right, in the later chapters of the 10th canto, when Krishna kills uh, Sisupala, it's not directly uh, it's not directly mentioned there that he went back to his original position as, uh, 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 as the gatekeeper. Reading there, one may have the impression that he went back to he went to the Brahma Jyoti. But if you read the Krishna book, the same part on the Krishna book, on the Krishna book, Prabhupada explains that no, they went back to their original positions. They just passed through the Brahma Jyoti, right? Because to enter a country, you need to pass through the border, right? The Brahma Jyoti is like the border between material world and spiritual world. So to go to the spiritual world, you have to pass through the border. But it's not that you stay at the border, right? You pass the border and then you go where you want to go, right? So uh, the fall of giant Vijaya does happen with the consent of the Lord, right? It's not a random thing. It, it's a pastime. Because otherwise, it would be impossible for any external force, including even a Brahminical curse, to push two eternal uh, associates of the Lord out of their eternal positions in the spiritual world. Right? This is this is not possible. And as Prabhupada concludes, uh, he says that all these incidents, therefore, were designed by the Lord Himself for the sake of His pastimes in the material world, like Haribo. And the Lord also adds that, uh, uh, that's verse 30, he says that, quote, this de departure from Vaikuntha was foretold by Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune. She was very angry because when she left my abode and then returned, you stopped her at the gate while I was sleeping. So Jai and Vijaya, they had developed this habit somehow. They, they also stopped the goddess of fortune before stopping the Kumaras. Right, so it was two times already that they made the same mistake. So, uh, so Lord, so Lakshmi Devi, she also became dissatisfied with the gatekeepers, right, when they didn't allow her to see the Lord when he was sleeping, and this was also a factor that the Lord took into account in his decision, right? So, uh, in their lives as demons. Jai and Vijay, they would practice mystic yoga in anger by constantly thinking of the Lord, like as his enemy, in anger. So in this way, they would be cleansed by the offense they, that they committed against the Kumaras, and very quickly they would return to their positions in the spiritual world. Three lives here in the material world, in the time of the material world, is just like a truthy, just like a fraction of a second. So, after the speaking at the door uh, of Vaikuntha, right, the Lord returned to uh, ah, so this uh, so I'm quote I'm going to quote here. So this is from thirty two to thirty four, right? So uh, so after speaking at the door of Vaikuntha, the Lord returned to his abode, where there are many celestial airplanes and all surpassing wealth and splendor, but those two gatekeepers the best of the demigods, their beauty and luster diminished by the curse of the Brahmanas, became morose and fell from Vaikuntha, the abode of the Supreme Lord. Then, as Jain Vijaya fell from the Lord's abode, a great war of disappointment arose from the demigods who were sitting in their splendid airplanes. Unquote. So, after narrating the whole incident, uh, uh, Brahma concludes that Jai and Vijaya, they had now entered the womb of Diti, and they were the cause of all this disturbance right, noted by the demigods. And uh, he said that that was the plan of the Lord, and thus there was nothing that he or the demigods they could do, right? They would have to just tolerate the disturbances caused by these two asuras, 
until the Lord would come personally to kill them, right? So, okay, so the problem was solved. Just, you know, matres parsa sukanteya, right? The demigods just had to, had to tolerate what to do. And then next topic is the fall, like quote unquote, the fall, so-called fall of Jaya and Vijaya. Okay, so the fall, right? Quote unquote of Jaya and Vijaya, after being cursed by the four Kumaras, is a very uh, significant event in the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's a very important topic. Bec uh, and great part of the narration of the Bhagavatam, it covers topics that are directly or indirectly connected with this event. For example, the pregnancy of Dit in the evening, the fight of Lord Varaha against Hiranyaksha, the pastimes of Pralada Maharaja and Lord Nishinhadeva, the advent of Lord Rama, and so on. Right? You see, so many pastimes, they orbit around this, this pastime. And this is also one of the, uh, also like possibly, one of the most difficult to understand passages of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Like it's quite a complex passage. So, the saga starts with the visit of the four Kumaras to Vaikuntha, right? Okay, this part we studied. So the chronology is that the meeting of Jaya and Vijaya with the four Kumaras happened at the end of the fifth Manvantara. And their first birth as demons happened a little later, in the sixth Manvantara, when the conditions from their birth, like the, um, Diti and Kasyapa Muni violating the regulative principles, you know, begetting children at the prohibited time. So they appeared when these conditions appeared, right? The conditions through their birth as great demons appeared. So they had to be born from some very great personality who would commit a very serious mistake. So when Kasyapa Muni and Diti, they no had relationships at the wrong time that was the opportunity that was the right time for them so uh so this was in turn after uh the pastimes uh connected with the sons of daksha in his second birth uh, being delivered by narada muni so this pastime is that after is that you know daksha he had so many sons and to populate the universe but narada muni he preached to all of them, and they all took sannyas. So Daksha became very angry, and he cursed Narada Muni for that. So after cursing Narada Muni, Daksha engaged himself in begetting doubters, right? And because he, he knew that Narada will not try to, you know, make my doubters take sannyas. So he, he beget only doubters at this time. And then he fulfilled his work of populating the universe, uh, through that, right? Through these ladies. So Diti was one of these daughters and she became the mother of Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu. And then the second birth of Jaya and Vijaya, Asravana and Kumbhakarna, they happened earlier in the in the current Mavantara, the seventh uh, Mavantara. And the third birth, Asisupala and Dantavraka, it happened recently when Krishna was present in your planet, right? So... Then uh, we have more points here. So, first of all, how did the Kumaras visit the Vaikuntha planets if it is described that before meeting the Lord, they were impersonalists? Interesting, right? Impersonalists, they, were not they are not supposed to go to the Vaikuntha planets. They are supposed to stay in the Brahma Jyoti. So, how the Kumaras, they attained the Vaikuntha planets? Interesting conclusion, right? Uh, in interesting question, right? So, in the Srimad Bhagavatam and also in other Puranas, there are many accounts of great personalities of this universe being able to visit Vaikuntha, Vaikuntha Loka, just like Druvasa Muni, the four Kumaras, uh, different demigods, great sages, right? Actually, many persons, they were able to visit Vaikuntha. We see the descriptions. So these personalities, they are not normally able to leave the universe. But they can sometimes reach Vaikuntha Loka through Svetadvipa. That is this that is this way to get there, this passage. And Svetadvipa is the abode of Kshirodakashai Vishnu, right? And Svetadvipa is actually a Vaikuntha planet 
that appears inside of, of our universe, just like Dhruva Loka is also a Vaikuntha planet. So Tsweta Dewepa is a Vaikuntha planet that appears inside of our planet as an island in the milk ocean. And like the milk ocean is one of the seven oceans of Bumandala. So the island of Sweta Dwipa is described by Srila Prabhupada in the first chapter of the Krishna book. So, okay, there is a long quote here. So, quote, Prabhupada is speaking. In the Vedic mantras, there is a particular type of prayer called Purusha Shukta. Generally, the demigods offer their obeisances unto Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, by chanting the Purusha Shukta. It is understood, Heren, that the predominating deity of every planet can see the Supreme Lord of this universe. Brahma, whenever there is some disturbance on his planet, uh, 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 Brahma, uh, whenever there is some disturbance of, on his planet. Uh, so, and Brahma can approach the Supreme Lord Vishnu, not by seeing him directly, but by standing on the shore of the ocean of milk. There is a planet within this universe called Svetadvipa. And on that planet, there is an ocean of milk. Uh, so just one point here. It's interesting that the planets, they are called Dwipas, or sometimes Varshas. Dwipa, if we translate literally, it's called, it means island. And Varsha means a tract of land. Uh, so, but Prabhupada, he, in many purports, like consistently in his purports, he makes this point that actually the planet, the, the Dwipas, like these islands that are described here, they're actually planets. So uh, Dwipa island in the sense is metaphor. It's metaphorical, right? Actually, they appear as planets. Uh, so, okay. So anyway, so it is understood by, from various Vedic literatures that just as there is the ocean of salt water on this planet, there are various kinds of oceans on other planets. Somewhere there is an ocean of milk, somewhere there is an ocean, ocean of oil, and somewhere there are oceans of liquor and many other types of liquids. Uh, the Purusha Shukta is the standard prayer which the demigods recite to appease the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Shirodakashai Vishnu, uh, Shirodakashai Vishnu, because he's lying on the ocean of milk, he's called Kishirodakashai Vishnu, Kishiro, Kishira, right? Uh, Kishira Daka, Kishira means milk, Kishira Daka Shai Vishnu, the Vishnu that lays on the ocean of milk. Uh, so, because he's, uh, uh, he's, uh, he's the form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, through whom all the incarnations of, uh, within this universe appear, right? This we studied already. All the incarnations, except Krishna and Balaram, obviously, they come from Akshirada Kashai Vishnu. Okay, so this is the end of the quote. So, uh, there is no difference between the, this island or this planet of Svetadvipa and the Vaikuntha planets in the spiritual world. But Svetadvipa is easier to reach because it appears inside of our, un our universe, right? So, easier. So it works, uh, Svetadvipa works thus like some kind of portal through which one can reach the spiritual sky without having to, you know, pierce through the coverings of the universe, cross the Brahma Jyoti and so on, right? So normally the demigods, they go to the border of the ocean of milk and there they offer their prayers to Kshirodakashai Vishnu from, you know, and from, uh, and uh, and from there, they wait, right, when they need assistance. But uh, sometimes, great personalities, they are able to directly reach Svetadvipa, just like Dhruvasamuni and so on. So when he was being chased by the Sudarshana Chakra, right, Dhruvasamuni, he went there. It's described that he went to the Vaikuntha uh, Lokas through Svetadvipa. So... It's not clear, it's not directly mentioned if the Kumaras reached the Vaikuntha Lokas through Svetadvipa or by, you know, directly going through the coverings of the universe. But in any case, being stopped at the door by Jaya and Vijaya, they became angry, right? And then they, they cursed them to become demons. And this was an extraordinary event that raises, of course, a lot of questions. And one of them is how being eternal inhabitants of Vaikuntha, like personal associates of the Lord, how could Jaya and Vijaya fall from there, even if temporarily, 
right? That's an interesting question. So, uh, so when reading it for the first time, we could get the impression that falling from Vaikuntha is like a normal occurrence. Like, just like, you know, there are many stories of Gandharvas and demigods being cursed, you know, falling from the celestial planets. Maybe people also fall from Vaikuntha. But no, this understanding is incorrect. It's quite wrong. Because the Vaikuntha planets, they are different from the celestial planets, right? The celestial planets, they are part of the material world. And under the influence of the three material modes, uh, now everyone there is under the influence of the material modes, right? And thus, one position, uh, a, a person's uh, position there in the uh, in the uh, celestial planets, they are uh, it, it's temporary, right? Uh, like uh, it's the the pos uh, uh, anyone's position in the celestial planets is temporary by nature. So one may stay there for a relatively long time, enjoy there, but eventually he will fall back to art. You know, by be dead, by a curse, or just by you know exhausting his pious credits. So it's temporary by nature. So falling from the celestial planets is thus not a possibility. It's a rule, right? <laughs> no one stays there eternally. If you don't go up, you go down. So, but when we speak about Vaikuntha, however, the situation is completely different, because as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, and that's fifteen six. That this that supreme abode of mine is not illuminated by the sun or the moon, nor by fire or by electricity. And those who reach it never return to this material world. Right? So the story of this falling of Jain Vijaya from Vaikuntha is thus included in the Srimad Bhagavatam, not to support the idea that you know Krishna's associates they fall you know regularly from the spiritual planets, like every day there is someone falling. Uh, uh, but no, it, it's a description of the glories of the Supreme Abode. Uh, there is no possibility that one could be forced out of the spiritual planets by any external force or also or also by the influence of lust and greed because these forces they are absent there right however like right, uh, in the Srimad Bhagavatam we have this situation that is narrated here right that the four Kumaras they cursed right and out of anger not only they cursed but out of anger they cursed two personal associates of Lord Vishnu and forced then out of Vaikuntha, in, in, falling into the material world to become demons, like inimical uh, to the Lord. So, yeah, how to understand that? So, uh, that is a way, right, of course. So, first of all, Sri Prabhupada, he mentions in his purport, and that's uh, verse 12, right, of this chapter, that the fall of Jain Vijaya is not a normal occurrence, right? It is an, uh, an accident, that happened to them because they offended the four sages. So as he explains, uh, quote, from, from this statement, we can understand how anxious the Lord uh, the Lord is to get his servitor back into Vaikuntha. Therefore, this incident proves that those who have once entered a Vaikuntha planet can never fall down. The case of Jain Vijaya is not a fall down. It is just an accident. The Lord is always anxious to get such devotees back again to the Vaikuntha planets as soon as possible. So, unquote. So because of the, the offense, Jain Vijaya, they get a temporary reaction. But because they are eternal servitors of Lord Vishnu, the Lord organized things so they could come back as soon as possible. Right? So see, you have these two sides. And there is another point. That is that they never really fell because they remained co continuously connected with the Lord by constantly meditating on Him in anger, right? So Prabhupada mentions in, in his purports that just as Jaya and Vijaya, they came to the material world to facilitate the, the pastimes of the Lord, many other personal associates, they, they frequently come here to participate in the pastimes uh, of the Lord in the material world, like, or, or also they come to preach, to assist other Vaishnavas, the Vishnu Dutas, they're coming all the time here to, you know, uh, protect other Vaishnavas, and also for other purposes, right? So there are 
liberated soul coming all the time from Vaikuntha here. However, it's not considered that they fall from such activities, right? Uh, so they just come here. They do, they have some purpose here. They come, they leave. So, so living the in the spiritual world it is thus not a matter of a geographical location, right? But a matter of deep connection with the Lord. So eternal associates of the Lord, they are connected to Him in such a way that even if they come to the material world for, for some purpose, they don't forget the Lord. Right. So in this sense, Jan Vijay they, they did not fall because they remained connected with the Lord, although in anger, right? So Srila Prabhupada comments on verse 26 that, quote, and this is an important quote, the conclusion is that no one falls from the spiritual world or Vaikuntha planet, for it is the eternal abode. But sometimes, as the Lord desires, devotees come into this material world as preachers or as atheists, like as demons in the case of Jain Vijay. In each case, we must understand that there is a plan of the Lord, right? So it's a pastime. It's not a fall. Okay. More questions. Questions about these mysterious pastimes. More questions. So, uh, so okay. So the pastime of Jain Vijaya is also yet another alert for the dangers of performing Vaishnava Parada, right? It's, it's really not a nice thing, right? It's not a nice thing to do at all. So even if Jain Vijaya, uh, so we can see that if even Jain Vijaya, they had to come to this material world right, and spend you know, three lives here as a result of their offending of the, of the four Kumaras, right? So keeping this in mind, uh, we can... And like we can just speculate how precarious will be our situation if we do the same, right? So although devotional service is, is eternal and it can't be ever destroyed, still offenses to other devotees, they can cover our devotional service for a long time. And this, of course, can result in a very unpleasant uh, trip to the you know dungeons of material existence, right? Okay, so the next question is how the four Kumaras, they could become angry and curse Jain Vijaya? Uh, because they were in the spiritual world, not? So they're supposed to not be influence of passion and ignorance there. So how is that? And the answer comes in, Bhagav in verse 25, purport. Prabhupada explains that the Kumaras, they were influenced by the modes of passion and ignorance. Prabhupada says, quote, the cursing of Jain Vijaya is here repented. Now the Kumaras are thinking in terms of their position in the modes of passion and ignorance. And they are prepared to accept the kind of punishment from the Lord. So, yeah, okay. Prabhupada says, uh, the Kumaras, they were in passion and ignorance. So this raises yet another question. Like, are the Vaikuntha planets not supposed to be free from the influence of the material modes, right? Especially passion and ignorance. So, uh, so this is answered in in, in, in further purports. So, Prabhupada explains that the, at that point the Kumaras they were as, still attracted to the uh, impersonal feature of the absolute truth, right? So they were not completely free thus from the influence of the material modes. And another point is that sometimes the Lord organized from, for beings from the material world to visit the Vaikuntha Lokas for some purpose. Like, for example, in the case of Druvasamuni, right? He went to the Vaikuntha just to be scolded by the Lord and, you know, have to go back and beg forgiveness from Barish Maharaj. Also in the case of the four Kumaras to, you know, start this whole pastime of Jain Vijaya and so on. So, uh, but because the Kumaras, they were not yet ready to stay in Vaikuntha, they visited there, they went all the way to the door, but they had to come back after their visit, right? And also, it's important, in the case of the Kumaras, it's mentioned that they did not enter Vaikuntha Loka. They went all the way to the last door, and from there, they returned uh, to the material world after getting the darshan of Lord Vishnu. So they never really entered the Vaikuntas. So it it becomes easier to understand 
uh, when we consider the possibility that they may have gone to Vaikuntha through Sweta Dweep. Because normally, uh, to reach the Vaikuntha planets, one has to go through the abode of Lord Shiva, the impersonal Brahma Jyoti, and so on. And these are all realms that are already free from the influence of the material modes. Right? The influence of the material modes exist, is exerted only inside the the universe. Like even in the Mahatattva, the modes are present there, but they're not really acting upon anyone. They're just present there as like elements. But they act only inside the material universes. So even if you go to the causal ocean, there is no modes of nature there. If you go to the Brahma Jyoti, you know, even less, right? Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so the so this possibility uh, that I uh, know the the Kumaras have gone through Swetadvipa, however, can explain this apparent contradiction because in this case there is a clear border between the material world and the spiritual world, right? Beyond the door, protected by Jain Vijaya. There was Vaikuntha, like a place free from the influence of the material modes, but the Kumaras didn't cross that door, right? So they, they so they, they were still on the material side, and thus they could be influenced by the material modes. And another point to consider is that the whole incident, they, it happened due to the will of the Lord, right? So it's described in the Lago Bhagavatamrita that being the two uh, strongest doorkeepers of the Lord, Jai and Vijay, they had the desire to serve the Lord by fighting with him. And at the same time, the Lord himself wanted to fight. And, and this desire, it could be satisfied only by, his, by one of his associates coming to the material world and playing the role of enemies. So the anger propensity of the Kumaras was thus used by Lord Vishnu to fulfill right, these uh, both purposes. Right? So that's another point to keep in mind. And the final question could be that if this pastime of Jain Vijaya cursed you know, by the Kumaras, you know, falling, you know, so-called falling from Vaikuntha, if this is repeated every Kalpa, right? And they, every time they play, you know, the roles of demons all the time, you know, again, falling down, being cursed and so on, if it's that so. But in the Lago Bhagavatam, Bhagavatamrita, and that's 1550, uh, Rupa Goswami, he answers that no, right? Uh, he says that the incarnations of Jain Vijaya, uh, as Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha and so on, they happened only in this particular universe, co coinciding with the course of, of the curse of the four Kumaras, right? So in other words, this is a special occurrence. In other universes and in other Kalpas, Lord Nishinhadeva and Lord Varaha, they fight with regular demons. It's not Jain Vijaya. Jain Vijaya was only here, right? Okay, now we come to some conclusions. So we can thus conclude that. Okay, let's read together. So there are six conclusions here. So first conclusion is that Jaya and Vijaya, they faced a temporary reaction by accidentally offending the Kumaras, right? They had to come for three lives. Okay. Uh, second conclusion, this was the will of the Lord. Uh, therefore, they were not pushed out of the Vaikuntas by an external force, nor by the influence of the three modes, right? It was, uh, you know, the desire of the Lord and actually their own desire to, you know, fight with the Lord and so on. So it's not by an external force that they, 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 they go out of the Vaikuntha. And then three, they never fell because they remained connected with the Lord through constantly meditating on him in anger. So they were you know, fully concentrated on the Lord. So the three lives that they spent in the material world, they are equal to just one like blip of time in Vaikuntas, like a fraction of second. So therefore, you know, practically speaking, they never left anyway. And then four, just like Jain Vijaya, other associates of the Lord, they frequently come to this material world for different purposes, like uh, to preach, to you know, save Vaishnavas and so on. So these are also not fall downs. And then five, 
the whole incident it serves as an example of the dangers of offending uh, other devotees, right? So although never you know, really falling from their eternal positions, Jai and Vijay, they had to face a temporary reaction, right? And then six, last point, that the falling, like quote-unquote falling of Jai and Vijaya is a special occurrence and not a regular pastimes that repeats every couple. It was just one time. So, one could be tempted uh, to use the story of Jaya and Vijaya as a support to the idea that souls, they fall regularly from the spiritual world, or conversely, right, on the other side, that we were never with Krishna because no, no one falls from the spiritual world, right? However, this story doesn't support either side because the situation of Jaya and Vijaya is different from ours because they never forgot about Lord Vishnu and they remain connected with him, right? The problem is that we really forget. That's no, it's different. So, Jan Vijaya, they, uh, they came for three lives just to assist the Lord in his pastimes, right? But in our case, it's different. We are, we are really uh, forgetful of the Lord uh, since time immemorial, right? Uh, so, okay. So, next point. How did we fall? Okay. About Jai Vijaya, we already understood, okay? But what about us, right? What is the situation in, in your case? So, uh, first point, the whole discussion about the fall or no fall of the soul is largely like misguided. It's mostly based on intellectual pursu pursuits, personal opinions, dogmas, emotions. It's like most of the time it's just like some material discussion. Prabhupada alerts us that this is an extremely intricate uh, philosophical question that is essentially impossible to understand why we are, we are still here in the material world and thus, you know, subjected to the influence of the material mode, material time, and so many other coverings. So in his teachings, Prabhupada, he actually gives a much more like nuanced understanding of this topic that that then you know most of us can understand not mo most of us can like grasp because properly emphasize that every soul has an eternal relationship with Krishna and that every soul has intrinsic love for Krishna that can't be ever lost right although it can be temporarily forgotten and he then offers to explain it, he offers the analogy of a dream to explain it. And this is an analogy that is easy to understand because, you know, we dream every day, right? We understand what a dream is. And a dreaming person, he may experience many different situations, right? But in reality, he never leaves his bed. So in this way, Prabhupada harmonizes the idea that the soul has an eternal relationship with Krishna an intrinsic natural law for Krishna with the idea that no one falls from the spiritual world. And these two ideas with the fact that we are here, right? So like this is like if anyone wants to create some, you know, novel theory about, you know, the fall of the jiva or whatever like that, his theory, he needs to reconcile these three ideas. The soul has an eternal relationship with Krishna, an intrinsic law for Krishna. No one falls from the spiritual world. We are here. So if you don't reconcile these three ideas, if you if you contradict any of these three ideas, then it's bogus. And you can know that it's, it's bogus. It's not correct. And you can see that, you know, uh, the explanation that Prabhupada gives is actually the only that makes uh, that makes sense. All the other explanations, they are not correct because they contradict one or more <laughs> of these three points. So ultimately, uh, however, this uh, you know, uh, forgetfulness or foul or whatever of the soul uh, is a great mystery. And even Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself, he didn't try to explain it. Instead, he prayed, uh, quote, O oh, son of Maharaja Nanda, Krishna, I am your eternal servitor. Yet somehow or other, I have fallen to the ocean of birth and death. Please pick up, uh, pick me up 
from this ocean of death and place me as one of the atoms at your lotus feet, right? That's from Sikh Shastaka. So somehow or other, we came to this material world, but this doesn't matter because now our goal is to come out of this ocean and regain or eternal spiritual position as Christian servants, right? That's what is important. Prabhupada explains that if a person falls into the ocean, his immediate problem is how to save himself. After he's out of the ocean, like neck in a safe situation, then he may calmly, you know, sit and, you know, inquire for the philosophical reasons of his falling to the ocean. Now it's okay, because now he's saved already. But, you know, to inquire about these things while you are still you know, fighting for your life in the ocean is not really a very good proposal. <laughs> so, uh, as Prabhupada wrote, Prabhupada made this point in Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya uh, 22107. He says, quote, Pure love for Krishna is eternally uh, established in the hearts of the living entities. He is, it is not something to be gained from another source. When the heart is purified by hearing and chanting, this love, this love naturally awakens. This is a verse spoken by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself. This is a this is the translation of Prabhupada. And then if you go to Adi 7.142, Prabhupada explains this in more details. He says that by the practice of devotional service, beginning with hearing and chanting, uh, the the impure heart of a conditioned soul is purified, and thus he can understand his eternal relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That eternal relationship is described by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Jivera Swarupa Hoy, Krishnera Nichadas. The living entity is an eternal servitor of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When one is convinced about this relationship, which is called Sambanda, he then acts accordingly. This is called Abhideya. The next step is Prayojna Siddhi, or fulfillment of the eternal goal of one's life. If one can understand this relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead and act accordingly, automatically his mission in life is fulfilled. So, see that Prabhupada here makes this point that this eternal relationship of the soul and Krishna is Sambanda. This is the basics of spiritual life. That's the foundation of spiritual life. Now, that's something that you know, is really the beginning of spiritual life. So, if one can't understand this point, that's not a very you know, solid <laughs> position, we can say. That's a really basic, essential, and fundamental understanding. Uh, okay, another point. If devotional service is eternal, then how can we forget? Okay, next question, right? So, Shal Prabhupada re uh, mentions repeatedly in his books that the soul is an eternal servant of Krishna, right? This point is very clear. Even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself, he speaks this in many occasions. But, due to the contact with material nature, we forget. Okay, he, Prabhupada also mentions that any progress, progress in devotional service is permanent and we never lose it. Okay, so even if we can't complete or practice in this life, then next life we will continue from the point we stopped. So this leads to another question. If devotional service is permanent, how we were able to forget Krishna in the, same, in the first place? What is the difference between the service we do now that you know supposedly is permanent, and the service that we were doing before that we somehow forgot, right? So considering this first point, uh, what is the guarantee that we will not forget again, even if we go back to Godhead, right? That's a question that many may have, and it's a perfect, honest question. So okay, let's try to understand it. So the eternal devotional service of that no, that the soul performs in his original position is never lost, right? It's only temporarily forgotten. Somehow or other, we enter into this dream of material existence, and here we become covered by the false ego, material intelligence, mind, senses, and you know, finally the gross body, and so on. So in this way, a new identity is formed. Right? This identity, this combination of false ego, mind, intelligence, and so on. This is a new identity. 
that is formed. And we identify, we, so, identify with this new material identity that is uh, created, right? And, and, and identify with this material identity, we think that we are separated from Krishna. And from this identification, we forget Krishna and, uh, and you know, to go back, right? The way back to our original position uh, is by while we still, you know, here, while we still identify with this material identity, coming in contact with devotees and starting again to practice devotional service, right? This way we can remember. Uh, so, we can see this, that our original devotional service is not lost, but it is covered by this material identity with which we identify at the present. So under this false identification, we can stay for a very long time here in this material world, like going from one body to the other, forgetful of our original position. However, when we again and again, quote, unquote, when we start again, right, quote, unquote, to practice devotional service under this temporary identity, then we can finally remember. Just like when we start dreaming, right, that we need to awake, that we need to wake up, like in the dream, you are dreaming that, oh, I need to wake up, it's time. And as a result, we really wake up, right? So it's something like that. So the devotional service that we do now is also never lost, but it even like while we are still here in the material world, but it can be temporarily forgotten, right? And even a serious devotee, he, he can fall into different traps, you know, make different mistakes and temporarily stop his service, right? Or even temporarily forget about Krishna. However, the power of his past devotional service make him eventually go back to the path and continue right so krishna himself as paramatma he helps the devotee to remember right inspiring him from within and also putting uh, in him into situations that he he can so he can again you know get in contact with devotees so in a sense it's because of the eternal service that we perform eternally in the spiritual world that we cannot, at a certain point, remember Krishna and start practicing devotional service, even while living in this material world. Because if the propensity of serving Krishna was not present inside the soul, then we will never be able to start serving Krishna at all. And then as a result, we will be eternally here right? Uh, like everything that exists is eternal. Everything that is not eternal is illusory, is material. So if the soul has the possibility of serving Krishna, then the soul must be eternally a servitor of Krishna. That's the correct, uh, that's the conclusion that makes sense. If the devotional service of the soul to Krishna would have to be established, if it would have a beginning, it would be material. It would be just temporary here in this material world. It would be illusory. It would be some kind of fantasy. It is only possible for the soul to come to the platform of service to Krishna because the soul is eternally there. It's just that somehow or other, you know, very difficult to explain how, but... Uh, we forget somehow, and then we stay for some time in this bad trip in this material world, right? Uh, so, yeah, so so in this way, like, we can see, like, that just like the devotional service that we do here makes us continue serving Krishna in the future, right, up to the point of going back to Godhead, the eternal service that we perform in our constitutional position Right, and I'm, I'm intentionally using the verb in the present here because the service is eternal, so it can only be used in the present. So this eternal service that we perform in our constitutional position is the cause of we remembering Krishna and is starting to serve Him even while living here in the material world. And of course, by this service, we become free from the material world. And the guarantee that devotional service is never lost and the fact that everyone goes back to Godhead showed, like, however, it should not be taken as like a license 
to slack in our spiritual practice, right? And and forget Krishna. Because if we fall again under the spell of the illusion, right? We can stay for a very long time in this material world, right? And just like happened when we you know, somehow entered in contact with the spiritual nature for the first time. So now that we have the opportunity, we should take it seriously. And now to finish, like a pastime of Narada Muni, that's from the book Maya, The Divine Energy of Bhakti Purushottama Swami. So in this book, uh, Bhakti Purushottama Swami, he tells the story of Narada Muni asking Lord Vishnu to show him the power of his illusory energy. And then as a response to his request, the Lord invited him for a walk, right? And so they were walking in the forest and while in the forest, although he was in Vaikuntha, right? Interesting detail. Narada is, uh, started to, fe to feel very thirsty. And Lord Vishnu pointed out to a nearby river and he told Narada that, that you can go there, you drink, and the Lord would wait. <laughs> you remember, just a, a short ago, Narada Muni had asked the Lord, Oh, my Lord, please show me the power of your illusory energy, right? And you see, it's starting. The, he started feeling thirsty. The Lord said, okay, you go to that river there. I will wait here. So Narada excused himself and he promised to return very quickly. So he went to the river. When he arrived at the river and prepared to drink water, right, with his, you know, joint palms, uh, he, a girl, a, a girl appeared and asked him to instead come to her house where they had some nice pure water. Like, please, dear Sadhu, you know, let me and my father serve you. And Narada, he accept, accepted the invitation and he was served, you know, very nicely by the girl and, and her father, right? They received Narada with all respect, you know, deserved by a great Sadhu and so on. So Narada was, you know, giving some Krishna Kata there. So Narada was uh, very pleased with their service attitude, right? And he asked if there was anything that he could do for them, right? Any benediction that they could offer them. And the father very humbly asked him to marry his daughter, <laughs> right? To see how it works and become his son-in-law. And then, you know, Narada was a little bit attracted to the beauty of this girl. And at the same time, he was obliged uh, by their by their service, right? So Narada agreed. Then Narada spends many uh, years involved in family in family life. He had a few children with this girl, and the girl was a very good wife, you know, very faithful wife, and so on. So they were living happy happy there in this village. However, one day there was a great storm, and the river overflowed, overflowed, right? Inundated the whole village. And the children, they were, they fell into the water and they, they were drowning pitifully, like, like, and the wife jumped instantly, right? Without thinking, she, she jumped to try to save the children, but she was defeated by the power of the currents and also started drowning herself. And then Narada jumped into the river and, and no, he tried to save his family, but he was also overpowered by the currents, and he also started drowning. And when he was almost dying, right, he somehow he remembered the Lord, and he loudly called, Vishnu, right, when he was dying on the river. And suddenly, boom, he was back on the bank of the river, where everything started. So immediately, he remembered that he, he had left the Lord, waiting, right, for such a long time. And then he hurried back to the Lord, and Lord Vishnu smiled and asked if he now he understood <laughs> the power of Maya, right? So, of course, uh, Narada is an eternally liberated soul, so he never falls into Maya like us. However, because he specifically asked, like, please show me, right? Then Lord Vishnu gave him a sample of how one can fall into the grip of the material energy and forget Krishna for a very long time, right? And Prabhupada explains that even if one takes birth in a good family, 
in his next life, there is no guarantee that he will become serious, like if a devotee, like someone who is practicing now. Even if he takes birth in a good family in his next life, there is no guarantee that he will become serious in his uh, spiritual path. Because birth in a good family also entitles one to many material opportunities, right? So we can practically, practically see like that not, not, not all children of devotees are always you know, very serious in spiritual life, like just to give an example. So the last point uh, is how can we be sure that we will never fall back down, you know, fall down again back into this material world after we go back to Godhead, right? Also an interesting point. So Prabhupada explains that when Krishna tells in the Bhagavad Gita that one who reaches the spiritual world never comes back again, it actually means practically never. Why? Because there is always a theoretical possibility of the jiva coming back again in contact with the material energy due to free will. Free will is always there, therefore there is always some theoretical possibility. Because the spiritual world is not a prison, right? So it's not like you are free to live if you want. However, in the spiritual world, the jiva has full knowledge. And therefore, you know, we, we can imagine that it's quite improbable that once experiencing, you know, the miseries of the material world, one will ever, you know, want to come back here again, right? Having perfect knowledge, perfect memory of what happened, even though he may have the freedom, right? So that's why Krishna says never comes back. And, you know, practically speaking, is like that. This possibility of coming back is only completely theoretical, right? Okay, so this is it for today. Hare Krishna, thank you very much. Right? All glories to Srila Prabhupada.